Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Rugby League Back Chat, the Championship Playoff uh, almost over. And we've got that to discuss and much, much more, including, of course, the Super League Playoffs. On the panel today, we have the Managing Director of the Huddersfield Giants, Richard Fulis, New York founder, Ricky Wilby, and the UK General Manager of the Toronto Wolfpack, Martin Vickers. Gents, welcome. We'll uh, dive straight in. And Ricky, I'm going to come to you first because Salford Red Devils are 80 minutes away from a grand final. Uh, I know it's a club that you've had, a, not involvement with, but you know a lot of people there. What a success story this is proving to be now. They've, they've had a great season, haven't they? Uh, and I think the back end of the season, they've, they've really pushed on. And I think that the playoff against Wigan probably galvanised them a little bit. And uh, I think they're, they're strong contenders for next week. Richard, we, um, we all make predictions at the start of the year. I don't think anyone had Salford first and foremost to finish in the playoffs, let alone third. Now they're one win away from making a grand final. Have, have they surprised even people with knowledge as such at the clubs and the players and the coaching staff and everyone like that? Well, well I think without a doubt they have. They've been arguably the success story of Super League. Fine advert for the salary cap in terms of equalisation of competition. Um, in terms of you can have a, a disappointing season and then you can move through the ranks and have a fantastic season. I really think the strong contenders uh, like Ricky as well. I expect them to give it a real dig at Wigan at the weekend. Martin, it was a club that you were involved at for some time when there were some very testing times when yeah, they're yeah. under different ownership and whatnot. How staggering is it that the club is where it's at now on the pitch and, and even off the pitch, seem, the pressure seems to have eased a little bit. Yeah, I think there's been some good work off the pitch. Um, the community um, bonds seem to have improved and credit to a lot of the guys off the field. I know many of the people who are working tirelessly doing voluntary stuff for the, the club and that seemed to have generated some great buy-in. At, at the time I was there, it was just as Ian Watson uh, came in as assistant to Yestin Harris. And you could see at that, that, that stage, you know, he, he was a, an, an absolute kind of student of the game. You could see when he was working in amongst the likes of Tim Sheens and, and others that he was learning and putting things into action. And, and there was a real buzz about him then being a, an innovator, uh, somebody who kind of man-managed really well. So it doesn't surprise me that he's got the results Richard just talked about there. Yeah. When you were there, the the finances and everything like that is talked about a lot, um, and you know there was talk this year that they were in all sorts of trouble. How bad? I know you can't go into a great deal, but how bad was it? How bad has that club found it financially and, and going through all of these rigorous times and troubles with salary cap and everything like that? Yeah. Well, 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 well when I was there, uh, Arwen Kukash was playing a leading role, and clearly he did invest. A huge amount of money at the time, uh, and and the clubs, it's public knowledge that they made significant losses and so on. Um, at the time I was there, they had clearly they had difficulties in terms of attendance levels, costs of stadium, and so on. And despite having reasonably good commercial deals in place, that's been a long-standing issue. It's not just an issue that was there in Mao and Kukas' time, it's historically been an issue about poor crowds in the Manchester Salford area. And, you know, in fairness, they, they have been starting to make some big effort to kind of get there. And hopefully the success on the field will kind of, and it, uh, providing they can sustain it for future years will be the thing that they need, you know, because success does bring fans in and let's hope that they are rewarded for their efforts. Richard, you made a point about salary cap, how it's, you know, Ju not justified it, but shown that it can work, this salary cap system. To pr thoroughly do that, to completely do that, do they need to win it? Because at the end of the day, we still only have four winners to have ever won a grand final. Well, well certainly to get to Old Trafford would be, uh, would be a phenomenal achievement because there are only a handful of teams that have actually you know, graced uh, the big stage. Um, It'd have been incredible to get. It's incredible what they've done to be third, mm -hmm. uh, but to get the next step and, and finishing the top two equally, could they go on and win it? Look, you know we're going to find out in about a fortnight's time. But um, but I think what what they have shown is that a fully fit and healthy squad, which they've been fortunate to have, and there'll be a lot of good management and good practice behind the scenes that, that we're not aware of here, which we should all take note of. If you have that run, and things do work out, even when you may be at your lowest ebb. 
things can improve pretty quickly in rugby league and in terms of every team will start the season and say if we can get our best 17 or 18 out on the paddock with a good side. Mm -hmm. uh, Huddersfield have failed to do that this season, they've had a disappointing year. Salford haven't, they've yeah. had their best uh, bodies in the main out there. Uh, one body in particular, Hastings, has, um, to me would be Man of Steel, mm -hmm. uh, and you may touch on that later, but he's certainly a strong contender for that. Led by him, they've just been fantastic. I don't think I'm going, I'm speaking out of turn, because you made it public knowledge on the Giants website that you actually went for Jackson Hastings before he went to Salford, yeah, we did. didn't you? And you look at that now and I bet <coughs> you wish, God, I wish we'd have uh, managed to get hold of him. Every team will look at players and say we should have had him, him and him, but yeah. we haven't. You know, we, we worked with what we've got. Um, way back then, we wanted Jackson Hastings to want to come to us, was the, was the reality, uh, and he didn't. Um, so if they don't want to play for you, Matthew, they don't want to play for There's you. And uh, credit to Salford, uh, he eventually, a bit further down the line, did go there. And I think he'll have completed two years uh, there at the end of this term. And then, of course, he moves on to Wigan. We've got a fine buy there. I think another point, Ricky, that Richard made is they've managed to keep the players on the field, where a lot of other clubs haven't been able to do so. You mentioned that you've struggled, but you're not the only club. How important has strength and conditioning become in this game now? Well, I think Richard will, Richard will know Salford's, Salford's strength and conditioning really well anyway, because he's a right. well, former Huddersfield yeah. uh, strength and conditioner. But I think uh, what Greg brings is he brings the uh, not only the strength and conditioning, but also the rehab side of it. And I think he's, he's really keen on, on getting players ready for the, ready for the games and, and preparing well, mm -hmm. not only before the games, but also after the games. I tell you what, though, Martin, we can talk about Salford all we want, but we've got to talk about St Helens. They, they were just phenomenal on Friday night. Yeah, it was, it was good to see them playing like they can. I think um, we, as, much, as well as Warrington played in the Challenge Cup final, it wasn't the Saints side that, um, and in fairness, Warrington didn't allow them to play, but it wasn't the Saints side that we, we loved to watch. And it was good to see them getting back to form, because what we want whether it's Wigan or Salford who get through, what we want is a spectacle for the sport. So we want both teams playing at the best. And it was great to see the big names all kind of coming together and peaking just at the right time. If they play like that in the grand final, can they be stopped, Richard? No, if they play like that, they'll win. Um, but we went to Wembley, so if they play like that, they'll win at Wembley. Uh, they didn't. Um, and they'll always be that question mark until they actually do cross the... Uh, the whitewash and, and win the big one at Old Trafford, but but it was a pheno it, it really was a phenomenal St Helens performance against a good Wigan side. Now they would say they didn't have their best team for whatever reason, but they are a good side, mm -hmm. uh, and should they get to Old Trafford, the memories of what occurred at St Helens are fresh in the mind, um, and I don't think we've seen a repeat show from the Wigan side if they can overcome Salford and, and, and get there for the grand final. That said, Ricky. We're going to have won 12 out of 14 now. The two defeats have been to St. Helens and fairly comfortable, haven't they? So while there is that side of it, is there also the argument that there might be that doubt that we can't, because they've lost them four times already now this season. Absolutely, they? yeah. And I mean, there's only two teams who've beaten St. Helens all, all year through the One Super League. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I think I think Wigan, Wigan won't be dwelling on on the defeats, I think they'll just be dwelling on, on what's positive and uh, and what they do well and just concentrating on themselves rather than past performances and, and St Helens. Last year, you got to the, I don't need to remind you, you got to the million pound game and didn't win on the big stage. St Helens have done it this year. You know leading into your own grand final, we'll talk about later, how the boys will be mentally at Toronto. Is that what's happened in the past going to work against them or for them, do you think, or can it work either way? I, I think it will work f for us in, the, in this this situation. I, I think uh, this time last year was a vastly different kind of place to where we are now. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very fortunate that we've got a fully fit squad. Uh, we're fortunate that we're, we're not having to do six flights in seven weeks. Uh, and, and I do feel on the point of that loss for St Helens in the Challenge Cup and using that to steal yourselves. I, I hear a lot of talk like that in around our team at this moment because, you know, let's, they were absolutely desperate after the London game. It was a, 
a setback, but I think it has been a setback that we have learned from as a as a club, not just on the field. But I do feel there's this quiet resolve in the team. You know, I I don't think it it needs anything from the coach around complacency. I think it's there already within the, the team that we've got and the and the new additions we've brought to the team in particular. Yeah. What are we thinking ahead of this final playoff game before the final? Salford, Wigan, Richard. I'll start with you. Can Salford do Wigan or are Wigan just going to be too strong for him again? Just. I think it's a level ball game for me. Normally you would say Wigan at home, Wigan the big team, mm. all the experience, all the big names, Wigan to win at home. However, <laughs> last week has just put a little bit of doubt, I think, in everybody's minds. Salford, everybody's talking about them on the crest of a wave. They've got Hastings on form. Um, it's a 50-50 game. Uh, for me, it really is. I think I think that close in terms of who can go on. What did the Saints game take out of Wigan? We don't know. What confidence did Salford uh, gain from giving Cass a bit of a drubbing? Uh, to be perfectly frank, and at that stage of the season, to you know, to, to nil a team at that stage of the year and, and look so dominant, that must have given them a massive boost. So it's it's fifty fifty for me. Matt. It really is. And Ricky, the fact that. Salford going with a win, Wigan going with a loss. We've seen with Featherstone, they've gone to York, who lost, beat them easy, gone to Toulouse and lost, beat them easy. If it follows that pattern, Salford have got a great chance. Yeah, they? I think Salford going with a little bit of momentum, especially like Richard said, the the defensive side of, of the win last week would, would really buoy mm-hmm. Salford up. Uh, I know Ian Watson and, and Ian Blaze will be really pleased with that, with that zero. I think, obviously, Jackson Hastings is a, is a key player for them. If, if Wigan can keep Jackson quiet, then mm-hmm. uh, then they've got a great chance, but not many teams have kept him quiet this year. No, not at all. Just on Man of Steel, you mentioned it, Richard. He's going to win it, isn't he, surely? He is for me. Yeah. Is anyone going to disagree with that? No. no. What about young player of the year? Because Morgan Smithers has absolutely wowed in recent weeks, hasn't he? But there are other Matty Lees, Jake Truman, Jack Walker, who's... I know Newman, Newman, Harry Newman, Newman as well. Yeah. yeah. They, that, I tell you what, what it does bring up that. We have some young talent in this competition at the minute. I mean, you've got, you've got loads of boys at the minute who are coming through. Louis Senior scored four tries to effectively win you that game. To, it does look quite promising how much talent there is coming through at this moment. And more than there has been maybe in years beforehand. Um, well, I think uh, from our own perspective, you know, we're reaping the benefits of, of the investment, a lot of investment that, that we've put into the academy under Andy Keller. Uh, so sort of for the last, I think Andy's been with us five or six years now. Uh, it is a long haul to get there. Um, there'll be new challenges for all these young players next year with the inception of the, of the reserve grade side. And um, f- Again, from our point of view, a lot of our seniors have been injured. So mm-hmm. that gave the senior twins, if you like, um, more games than, than ideally was the plan at the start of the year. They've grasped their opportunity. The challenge for our young players now is to get through the pre-season, have a good pre-season, and, and put some doubt in the coach's mind about does he stay with the younger players mm-hmm. or does he go back to the more experienced 100 plus Super League game uh, players that we have in the squad. So we have an interesting three month period to see who actually attains those those initial uh, starting slots come, come February. While we're on Huddersfield, just talk us a little, because you're very active at the minute in trying to sort of make plans for next year. You've just changed Andy Kelly's role to rugby manager and I'm sure you're doing things with recruitment. What, Where are you at at the minute as a club leading to 2020? Simon's in Australia at the moment. He's gone down to uh, meet a lot of players, agents, and, and spend some time actually with the Melbourne club okay. um, in, in terms of looking at how they operate things. Um, the market for, if you like, big name superstar signings, frankly, I don't, it doesn't exist, uh, is the reality at this moment in time. There are a lot of clubs looking to do a bit of trading. You know, we'll have A if you take B, and then C will move move to there, etc. There are also a lot of clubs, I think, that we're waiting to see uh, what uh, Martin's team uh, does at the weekend, Mm -hmm. because they're uh, a club that have massive ambition. I'm sure they will go into the transfer market, and that that again then will have some some effect um, within within Super League as a whole. But but by and large, um, the the talent that that we want to look and attract at Huddersfield, if we can, Mm -hmm. is English-based talent, you know, with a sprinkling of the odd overseas superstar. So um, we open this week to, to retain Joe Wardle uh, from, from the Castleford Club uh, and it's well publicised in your newspaper, I'm led to believe. You've got a scoop there <laughs> that Ashton Goulding, that the Featherstone, and not the lead stroke, Featherstone 
uh, lad is high on our agenda and, and whilst that's not concluded, hopefully uh, things may, may be progressing in the right direction there because uh, Simon is keen to, to look for a specialist fullback for us. You could probably have six or seven clubs sat at the moment in time saying they're looking for a big forward. Yes. We're all looking for a big forward. Um, from our from our point of view, we've we've got we think two fantastic big forwards in Wilson and English, mm -hmm. but they could perhaps just do with uh, with that older, more seasoned veteran, maybe just for a year to to try and bring them through. So there'll be a few uh, a few bits of movement in and a few bits of movement out. I think before we get to the start line. Well, I tell you what, we'll have a break in. We'll talk about the overseas player pool after a short break. So coming up, we will talk about the NRL players available to Super League clubs at the minute, plus the Championship Grand Final and much more. Join the conversation too on Twitter at RL Backchat. We'll be back after this short break. You've spoken and we've listened. Rugby League Back Chat is available on podcast form from all your best podcast providers. If you're on a trip down the M62 or a flight to Toronto or Toulouse, download Rugby League Back Chat for the best debate inside Rugby League. Welcome back to part two of this week's Rugby League Back Chat. Gents, before the break, or Richard more specifically, you were just talking about the sprinkling of overseas talent. Now, there are a few players being offered around at the minute, but... Just to outline the challenges of recruiting overseas players in terms of salary cap and everything like that at the minute. Well, on the last stat, and it, and it went back a couple of years, I think the average price of or the average salary cap value of, a, of an NRL man was about twenty to twenty-five thousand pounds in excess mm. uh, of an English player. I suspect that that may have crept uh, a little bit higher since we last had those figures produced. But they've got to want to come. I think is the is the sort of key issue. Um, that, that clubs need to overcome when, we, when we're looking for these overseas players. They've got to desperately want to come and prove themselves in this competition. It's a tough competition. I think there are far too many that come across thinking it'll be relatively easy, a um, bit of a soft touch compared to what they've been used to. And, and as we all know, you know, it, it most certainly isn't. Um, <clears throat> and for every successful overseas signing, there's been one that hasn't sort of uh, been as successful, and we've all had them. Um, it is a challenge. Uh, hence why you know Simon's across there at the moment trying to meet as many people as he can and get a feel for precisely what the marketplace is on the ground. But the finances are, are, are what they are. Their expectations are so much higher. You then factor in the flights, the accommodation. Yeah. They can't get a car because they've no credit, so you have to get a car. And, and there are all sorts of visas. There's another, another hidden cost that, that maybe people don't see, but, but they're expensive as well. So. So it is a big challenge, but, but the key challenge is getting the right one. It's, mm -hmm. you know, as Salford have with, with Hastings, he mm -hmm. is, he was the right fit for that club at that time. Uh, I mean, Ricky, in your opinion, what's, what's the strike rate on successful overseas players in Super League? Because it, it can be hit and miss, to it, be fair to It say. can be hit and miss. Uh, I'm sure you look back at Martin's time at Salford and he probably regrets a couple of signings yeah, yeah. that, that came miss, in. miss, miss, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, uh, Kevin Locke, I forgot about yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. But, then, but then you look at, like you said, Jackson Hastings has, has been great. Leeds generally seem to, to do pretty well out of their overseas players. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose it all comes down to injuries and keeping players fit and, and whatnot. I think Huddersfield have struggled to keep some of their, their main overseas players fit over the last couple of years. So... Mm -hmm. I think it all comes down to, to fitness levels. Just quickly before we go on to Toronto, while we're on it, we best discuss it. Trent Merrin, uh, Leeds have given him permission to leave the club, uh, get a club in the NRL on compassionate grounds. Uh, Martin, I guess it's one of those challenges that every club faces and you've just got to bite the bullet this yeah, one. Yeah, we, we all will have had experiences of players who've not settled and um, or players who've had 
domestic issues back at home that they've attended to. You know, we, we've had issues during the season like that. And, you know, Leeds seem to have done the right things throughout the season in, in managing that. And ultimately, you know, a player's got to be settled and happy. They, they, they are not going to be successful on the pitch if, if their environment, if, if, if they're not comfortable and stable. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just have to make decisions for the benefit of the, of the player, to be honest. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, we will have all have had experiences like that. And I think we generally, the game holds our hands out in those situations and helps, which is sure what's happening with the Rhino situation. Richard, to, to lose an, an overseas player, a marquee player, at this stage of your recruitment plan is never ideal. How bad is this going to affect Leeds in terms of their plans for next year? Uh, well, he's a marquee player, uh, as you like to say. So w whatever he's paid, he's classified at, at one seven five. Mm. Um, I guess ultimately, if he, if he does uh, end up going home, then the slot is there for somebody in Australia to uh, to attain. And and all the agents, trust me, all the agents in Australia will be very, very much aware of this situation. Mm -hmm. it, it may be that. Um, that one of the players down there is going to fancy putting their hands up for Leeds. Leeds, with respect, is an easier sell than Huddersfield because it's Leeds, one of the biggest rugby league clubs uh, in the world. Probably the most successful club in terms of grand finals. So they're an incredibly attractive proposition. Mm -hmm. I don't think for a minute that Leeds Rhinos will be short of takers to put their hand up and say, we'll take that marquee slot that may be available at the Rhinos. Mm -hmm. Or they may be brave keep the pepper dry and, and bring again some of these outstanding young players that they have got you know, into the first team squad because they have got a good crop. Yeah, it certainly seems like they're planning on that with a few. Martin, let's ask about your recruitment because it seems shrouded and clouded in mystery. No one seems to have any rumours to report about Toronto Wolfpack re recruitment yeah, yeah, other yeah. than a, a few rugby union players named here and there. So what can you tell us? What, what are you planning on doing for recruitment? Well, it must year? be the only thing, Matt, that's not coming out about the club, I think, uh, publicly. Yeah. But I... I Look, I, I think people are often ask myself and others around the club, oh, who's the big names that you get? And they do that because at the rate of knots we've been traveling, there has been a huge shift in, in kind of personnel. Um, but actually, if you just look at the facts around our club, you know, there are not that many people off contract at the end of the year. We have got a coach who we believe has an ethos of improving the talent that he's already got. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think this, the thing that might disappoint people out there is, is that actually uh, the bulk of that squad will stay intact mm -hmm. because we feel it's a squad that's gelled together, that culturally off the field we've made some massive improvements over the last 12 months and we want to keep that squad together. Obviously we've got quota spots become available, Ashton Sims will retire and so on. So we still have got room for, mm -hmm. for manoeuvre. Um, I share Richard's views on the NRL. Similarly, you can triple and quadruple that for rugby union players. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we ha have spoke to players who are playing in the World Cup, mm -hmm. uh, players who have shown a willingness to come into rugby league, and that's uh, in the UK and overseas as well. Uh, so we're kind of keeping our powder dry for some signings, but we may be talking here about the last 15, 20% of the squad. Yeah. Um, a key thing for us because, yeah, we talked in the, in the last five minutes about that depth of youth talent at Huddersfield and at Leeds. That's something we're not blessed with because we, we haven't got that history. So, so a massive part of our recruitment agenda next year will be to sign in in the region of about five or six top class youngsters mm -hmm. uh, to give us greater depth to the squad. Again, we've got a coach who is used to being in that environment where he's got a huge amount of young potential coming through. Mm -hmm. That's something we've got a 23, 24 man squad at this moment in time. So we want to get to 30. Mm -hmm. with, and when we are scouting, the, particularly in the UK, that kind of under-21 talent at the mm -hmm. moment to try and kind of bolster the, the depth of the squad. There has been a lot of talk, before we go on to that, about the the rugby union side of things. How some of the... I mean, Danny Cipriani was brought up, but I know that you were keen to 
not not say that it wasn't true, but you might be wrong on that one sort of thing. Politely saying it might, you might be. No, it's interesting off. because uh, there wasn't anything in that. And uh, funny enough, I was talking about another player uh, with a rugby union agent the other day, and he said uh, you should have asked me about Danny Cipriani because I'm his agent. But um, <laughs> but yeah, so so some but. W- Look, it's not just about getting a name for name's sake. Uh, you know, we are looking at specific positions where we feel that transition can be achieved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, as I say, we're not just looking uh, within the UK. We're looking at South Africa, Australia and, and further beyond. So, so it's just got to be, you know, the two Bryans will decide. They've already decided what position they think is the right one. And then we're between the across the club, we're now looking for that kind of talent. So, yeah, there's a lot of eyes peeled on the World Cup at this moment in time, and obviously uh, there's some Canadian talent in there as well, you know. But uh, maybe we should not judge them until they finish the All Blacks game next next week. I I'm think. pretty sure I've not name dropped a single player on anyone, so I'm putting you on the spot here. I apologise, but the name that won't go away, certainly among the fans, is Sonny Bill Williams. I know that David said that. Uh, Several months ago, oh yeah, we'd love to sign him. Is is there anything in that? Can we can we get excited about him maybe coming to so so, the game? so we said on the record last year that we 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 did have a conversation. Uh, that conversation was particularly around him playing in the Middle Eights. Mm. Uh, so we had an open door conversation with them. Uh, we'd like to think that's conversation's not stopped mm. and there still may be an opportunity in the future, but. You know these things can can happen for all kinds of reasons. You know the the the, the minute David talked about that, we had an England rugby union player in the World Cup come forward and say, "I, I want to play for Toronto Wolfpack." You know, so it, it's it's interesting uh, how how these things come about. Some some of this we may not be known to us at the moment, but we we certainly are talking to at least two or three. Um, players outside of the Sonny Bill Williams thing. There's okay. been no recent discussions with Sonny Bill Williams. Right. And just on the youngsters, um, you mentioned that you, you know you're going to bring a few in. There's obviously a lot to do with the club in terms of, of youth development and so on. The stuff you've been working on in schools and colleges. How are you getting on with that in Canada in getting youngsters playing the game? Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm pleased to say that like rugby in general is kind of thriving in Canada. You know, so you've got a hundred thousand kids playing rugby union so there's certainly uh, there's a depth of talent for us to to look at you'll see with our community programs that week in week out you see our players doing things over there but Mm. you you know it's all a case of time in here you you know you've got to grow that and you've got to grow it for five years and I don't see that you know we spent half a million touring the states touring canada trying to recruit people recruited 20 20 people to come across but they just weren't at that level and that was when we were in league one so it's just one of those things that you know you've got to try and fast track it to some degree and whether that's a a canadian rugby union player or or what have you those are things that we we're constantly looking at to be honest Mm -hmm. yeah fair enough uh on to the championship grand final then you play where the team that we are at home after the featherston who are absolutely flying. Um, what are your thoughts going into this game in terms of, well, just everything, the match itself, promotion, so on, so forth? Yeah, I, I think I think the thing we have to focus on is ourselves. Hmm. I think, uh, and that's the strong message I feel from within the camp. The, they've not got that eye on, could it be Toulouse or could it be Featherstone? They know, that they've played both teams now two or three times, so they, they know they're in for a, a tough ride. So I do feel it seems like a very calm, focused camp. I alluded to this earlier, but it's a, it's a fit and well camp. It's a camp that is coached by somebody who knows how to play these big games. So so the moods are one of quiet confidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of new additions in the squad from last year. So yes, there's many of the people who kind of would be strengthened by that resolve to go one better than last year. Mm-hmm. But when you look at some additions of the experience of Wilkins and Latellas coming into the camp, the, these are players who've played in big games mm-hmm. and that's just been invaluable, you know, over over recent weeks. So, so I feel that the mood's good. Nobody's underestimating uh, certainly Featherstone, you know, they're mm-hmm. extremely well coached. It's a club that we really do respect. 
Uh, we've worked hard with Featherstone, as we have done with all the clubs, to make sure all the players are able to play and travel, and and they will be well looked after as always by the club. So it's going to be a really tough game. Um, let's hope it'll be one step too far for Featherstone. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've, well, there's a self confidence in the camp. I would say, Mark. Ricky, Featherstone yeah. are 80 minutes from Super League. What a story! It's a that great is, story, well. isn't it? It's a great story. I don't think anyone gave them gave them much of a chance going into the playoffs, uh, especially having to go to Toulouse. Uh, although I think the travel coming back from Toronto probably probably hurt Toulouse a little bit. But they've generated momentum and they've built momentum throughout the season, and, and they've added a few a few good signings. Uh, Chisholm, I think, has has really galvanised them a little bit, uh, and especially like last night, I thought I thought that he was. It was very good, uh, but I thought I, th I just think they're, they're starting to build a little bit of momentum, uh, and much like we were saying about Salford earlier on, potentially that momentum might just just mm -hmm. trickle in. Like Martin said, the experience of Brian McDermott, he knows how to win big games, uh, and we've seen that through his time at Leeds, uh, and the experience of bringing in the likes of John Wilkin, they might just have the edge. Mm -hmm. Richard Feverston v Toronto. You say that as a final, and in any other sport, people wouldn't be able to grasp the concept of a <coughs> West Yorkshire mining town playing a big Canadian city. It's such a strange story in so many ways, isn't it? It's uh, it, it <coughs> is. You look at look at the wider picture, but uh, credit to both sides, they've gone about things in in a different manner. Toronto have coming um, to the competition in, in, in with a different model to anything that, that the championships probably ever seen before. Um, it's a massive game, Matthew. I mean, it's billed as a million pound game. It's probably the two million pound game mm -hmm. in actual fact, if you look at the the sort of sums involved. So, it's um, it, it really is uh, a tough one to call, but everything is stacked against Featherstone. That's the reality of the situation, as it was against London last year, mm -hmm. uh, and they prevailed with a phenomenal showing. So. A bit like the, the the Super League situation with Salford and uh, and Wigan, I almost see it as a level game. Mm -hmm. I really do because the pressure is all on Toronto. They've got two, well, two of the of the, of the biggest names in the sport in Noble and McDermott, who've been there, seen it all, uh, and done it against these upstarts from Featherstone here that are battling the way uh, against adversity. Lost two key forwards, I think, in Day and Walters, and Walters which which will hurt them in that game. But we thought it would hurt them in Toulouse, and it didn't. They've been absolutely fantastic. They will go across there. They'll be shattered from coming back from Toulouse. They'll have a, maybe a day or two days at home. Mm -hmm. Then they fly out to Toronto. Martin says they will be well looked after. I don't think they're that well when there's a final uh, at stage. Certainly <laughs> wouldn't they? Uh, if I had anything to do with it. So it's all against Featherstone. And sometimes in rugby league, when it's all against you, you might just get that shock. Well, we'll talk about it a little bit more after a short break. Coming up after this break, we'll talk a bit more about the championship grand final and what's going on with the promotion criteria with Super League. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the final part of this week's Rugby League Back Chat. Martin, I'm coming straight to you because there's been so much talk about whether Toronto will actually be let into Super League if they get promoted. Robert Elston can see Richard shaking his head be behind me. Richard Elston said he's still wanting assurances and this and that. From a Toronto perspective, what is your take on where we're at currently going into this grand final with you going up or not? Yeah, well, well it's straightforward enough. Legitimately, the game's been asking Toronto of lots and lots of different assurances, whether that's around 
markings on the pitch to flight itineraries and so on. And Robert Elston is right that this isn't the typical assessment compared to other clubs that, that come up because it's this whole kind of logistical challenge. Uh, there's that assurances about the sustainability of the club and so on. We've worked constructively with the RFL. I'd like to feel like every, every question that's been put our way, and there's been many, uh, have been responded to. And it should be something I'm pretty sure gets re you know affirmed before the actual final. Um, I, I, th I think for me, aside from the assurances that the game's needed, I, I think it's quite an interesting point three years on to kind of reflect on the kind of due diligence assurances that are probably there. We've a thousandth player has now come to Toronto last mm -hmm. week, last time yeah. with Toulouse. Uh, less than a handful of immigration issues, not all of which were dealt with, because, probably because of administrative challenges for the club, which you won't get mm -hmm. in a Super League environment. You know, not a piece of luggage being lost, not, not everybody, I can remember Carl Hall, the Vice President of the Arab saying it's the best rugby experience mm -hmm. he's ever experienced and he'd been all over the world with those things. So, you know, we all fully understand where questions are being asked. We've had lots and lots of meetings. We've given all the assurances. I feel it's close. Uh, so I await some announcement from the RFL Super League in the forthcoming days. Richard, let me come to you. What's your take on what's been going on? Yeah, I mean, you, you've said quite strongly you don't see what, what's, what's, you don't really get why it's dragging on like this. I, I don't know what the issue is. Uh, I don't think there is an issue uh, in reality. Everything that I've seen that said, that said of all the five participants in the championship playoff, they all meet Super League criteria, so they're in. End of. I, so I why don't did know Robert why this say why on. Yeah, why did Robert Elston say what he did, that, they st that Super League still needed assurances then? Why, what was the thinking behind that? No idea. It's strange. Are, are the clubs surprised? Were the clubs surprised? When Super League don't actually have the right to say who comes into Super League. Mm. That's the initial point that I would make. That decision sits with the RFL. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as I'm concerned, as I repeat, the five clubs ticked all the boxes and it was perfectly clear, as far as I'm aware, that whichever one of them was successful at the end of the campaign would be in Super League. End of. Simple yeah. as. So, my, what's... Because you'll have had discussions with clubs. What, what's, what's your take on the whole situation? Why we're... Because ultimately, we're leading into the week of... A, of a team going up, and we still don't know. According to Supley, we haven't had the we haven't had the confirmation that you will be allowed in yet. Yeah, so, so Richard's right. It's it's an RFL decision. So all the criteria that are put to us are put through the RFL. Uh, I've had some brief dialogue with Robert, where he did send me some communication with kind of comments and concerns from Super League clubs. That's, this was some time ago. Yeah. So. There's the kind of RFL list, there's been that list, an informal kind of list. It, 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 literally, we've kind of ticked all the boxes, really, with it. it there are some, look, you wouldn't ex there are some legalities that have to be crossed as well. So we, we have a legal agreement with the RFL. Mm -hmm. We have a legal agreement if we were successful, like any club going into Super League has to sign legal agreements. So there are some formalities to complete that may may well be completed after the game. But surely this should have been done before now. I mean, you know, the, we are in, what, October, September? Yeah, well, look, Matthew, I, I'll cut in there. I think they have been done. Right, okay. right. I, I think there's certain individuals in the media have got an agenda here trying to, to make a bigger story of okay. something that that frankly isn't a story. Let's concentrate on who wins this game on Saturday mm -hmm. and then the Super League competition, the Rugby League, whatever you want to call them, will embrace that team uh, and hopefully they will enjoy, or we will all enjoy, what either Toronto or Featherston mm -hmm. can bring into the competition you know, next year. But the winner of that game will play in Super League mm -hmm. and whether clubs say, well, you know, we don't like the flights to Toronto, we don't like the accommodation, that's for the clubs to sort out as and when they draw Toronto mm -hmm. in, in that particular round. Mm -hmm. And whether Toronto say, well, we can't play at home for a period of time, we all know that. Mm -hmm. We get on with it and we make it happen. If we play Toronto, and we have to play here. Mm -hmm. Both clubs get together you know, and, yeah. and they make it happen. So I think we're, we're building something up here that mm -hmm. doesn't exist. 
let's talk about the game mm -hmm. and what a fantastic game it's going to be. I, I hope you're right. I, I hope and, you're right. And, and Matt, what Richard just said, which is you know really positive, is a tip. We do have lots of conversations directly with Super League mm -hmm. clubs where we're hearing that, you know, and people. People are even talking to us, if you have to have an on-the-road game, let's do it in the best interests of Super League and play it in this venue here and yeah. there. So, But we've focused on the game, you know, we, yeah. we can't get distracted by that, you know. And there's some of these things, you know, when London was successful, they signed their legal agreement with Super League after the actual okay. the game. So some of these things are just the way it's done. Right. And it's just a little bit more pronounced because it's Toronto. Is that, do you think that's what it is? Is there, in your opinion, a bit of an agenda against Toronto? Or is it not so much an agenda, but because it's Toronto, because it's this big... Do, do, you, know, know, do, do you know what? I genuinely believe that, and I wasn't around at the time, but I genuinely believe that when the Wolfpack came on the scene, there was a real focus in their consultations, um, and this was the way they were channeled to go with the lower league clubs. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't feel from day one. I, I think there has been a vacuum in terms of how t how the Toronto model has engaged with Super League, and 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 that's just the way we were told to go. And I do feel because of that, clubs can only kind of go off things they hear, experiences from other clubs, and so on. And and I do feel that's improved. But we're not saying there hasn't been hiccups along the way. Of course there has. Yeah. And and but I, I feel. Personally, I feel through engaging directly at the moment with Super League clubs, just as you naturally do, the game's a close-knit group. Mm -hmm. Actually, the more I'm hearing that kind of positive noise, you know, from Richard. But like you say, it's the last thing on our mind and our players' minds at the moment. They, they're they playing to win on Saturday, Saturday evening, you know, so. Are you looking forward to the prospect of Toronto in Super League? and know everything that it brings? Uh, frankly, not particularly. Uh, I'll be honest with <laughs> you, I don't mind saying that in front of Martin. Um, it'd be a lot easier for us to, to come to Featherstone or, or indeed play Bradford or Halifax. You, you sort of know my views on that. But but if they're in there, then, then we've got to embrace it. We've got to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, their challenges are, are different uh, and they will bring different challenges to us as well because mm -hmm. um, it will be new. But you know, we, we've got to overcome these challenges. And as soon as they're in, we'll embrace them and enjoy them. We'll all try and beat them, because that's, that's what it's like, and send them straight back down again, as they'll do to, to one of our clubs. But it, it, it will be, um, it, will be it, it will be different, it will be difficult, mm -hmm. you know, but it's a challenge that, that's there for us. And, and for all clubs, you know, you might have Catalans away one week, then mm -hmm. you might be going to Toronto away the other week. The club will overcome uh, any challenges uh, and we'll make this thing work however we do it. Mm -hmm. For the supporters, it's going to be a, a different experience. I know a lot of championship supporters have been across and, mm -hmm. uh, and for a one-off trip, again, it's more expense for the supporters. We asked them to go to Catalan, to Magic, to the Grand Final, to Wembley. We're going to be pushing now and, and rightly, Martin's going to be pushing us all to take a lot of supporters into Toronto to, mm -hmm. to back up the, the support that they've had from their local council or, or whatever you call it across there. So it's going to be a big ask for the supporter mm -hmm. that says, well, I haven't missed a Huddersfield game for X number of years. I haven't missed a Leeds or, or whatever game uh, that you follow. So there are lots of different challenges that we're all going to have to get used to the yeah. broadcaster mm -hmm. as well as an issue. But I'm confident that, that certainly at Huddersfield we can get there uh, and make it work. And mm -hmm. I'm sure the other clubs can as well. Ricky, you were there not too long ago. I was. How do you find it? I thought the the actual experience was was outstanding. Uh, obviously, I've spent a lot of time down in France as well, uh, and up until my trip to Toronto, I always thought going to Catalan was a was a great trip. But I, I must admit the the hospitality that we received, the friendly atmosphere that we received, the uh, the club were great. They couldn't do enough for us. Uh, I think they were brilliant. Good for you to pick their brains a little bit as well. Absolutely, yeah. We spent a few days up there, so it was mm -hmm. nice just to just to sit down and, and speak with their with their management team and, mm -hmm. and and see what they're about and and just explain what, what we were about as well. Richard, here's a question. What would be the better outcome for Super League? Not in terms of logistics and travel and everything. What would be better for Super League? Having Featherstone Rovers in the Super League or Toronto Wolfpack? 
You ought to have asked preempt to that question. Uh, <laughs> let me practice that before. I'm. That's a tough question. <laughs> that is a tough question. Look, don't say that. Don't ask Toronto that. are coming in without central distribution, <laughs> so the clubs themselves, the clubs themselves, will benefit from uh, a substantially increased distribution as a result of, of the Toronto model. Some of that money that is, if you like, saved or foregone uh, by by Toronto will go into the central pot and that will be used to improve the marketing overall of Super League. So Super League would benefit in that respect and the clubs would benefit in that respect. Are we a better proposition to sponsors uh, and broadcasters because we've got Toronto in? The jury's out on that one. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a lot to be said for having Featherstone in the competition. Mm -hmm. If you're a Wakefield or a Cass fan, you're going to want to come here on Derby Day. That's a definite, mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa. And that little triangle, that hotbed that we've got here in West Yorkshire, um, would make fantastic... This place would be packed out, yeah, yeah. packed to the rafters if Wakefield and Castleford come here next year. Mm -hmm. That will be fantastic, mm -hmm. fantastic television. So it's a bit of a knife-edge one. Yeah. You may straight away say, yeah, Toronto's the easy answer there because of those reasons. Mm -hmm. But just imagine this place on a Friday night, mm -hmm. you know, middle of summer, packed out, West Yorkshire derby. Phenomenal. I'd be here, that's for certain. But I just, oh, go on, Ricky, you were going to say Sorry, something. I was just going to say, when, when we went up to Toronto, Toronto openly said that, that they, they, they've they predicted that they're going to get a, a, uh, one billion eyeballs on them this year yeah. throughout media, social media, mm. and, and whatever else, watching TV and in the stadium. I think that's a massive opportunity that, that for me, Super League can't afford to, to lose out on that, on that billion eyeballs. In terms of... Look, the, the jury will be out if you go up. There's, there's no doubt about that, Matt. And are you confident that you will be able to, after 12 months, after 24 months of being in the Super League, if you, if you can stay in, that from a broadcast point of view, from a commercial point of view, you will have strengthened the competition? Yeah, I mean, I mean a, a, a really pertinent fact. I've told you before that like our club really is intense on looking at all our numbers around eyeballs and so on and a really key one i saw the other day that in the same stage of development three years in as the raptors our numbers are blowing them right. you know out of, the, out of the ceiling really and i just kind of feel like you know that's been a huge part of our strategy about growing the media audience and growing it not just for us it's for the game you know let's not forget the championships this year is enjoying record viewing numbers and that's because 90% of it has been funded by the Wolfpack mm -hmm. funding games yeah. and yeah it's a great product and the clubs have all contributed to that but that's what we've been about and we're doing it for a reason mm -hmm. to ultimately commercialise and monetise that for our own benefit and, and for the good of the game mm -hmm. you know so so when next month we uh, launch our new rugby strength products on the on the tenth of the month. That's that's a huge off field development for yeah. us. That says, hang on, ultimately when these things work, you you're not just reliant on things like sky money or attendances or merchandise. Yeah. And so so we're not just talking about it, we've grown it and we're doing something about it. In terms of the travel, will you still be covering the the cost next year or well, well look the, that's part of the agreement that we we currently have okay. yeah yeah so so yeah so, don't wriggle out of that one now yes so, <laughs> so, so that's look, what, where we need where we need to get with with this because that is all part of the agreement now it, it's it's where we we need to work with super league to kind of make sure the upsides are for us both yeah. you know so actually if we play huddersfield in an on the road game at Spurs next year or wherever, you know. It's exclusive. I, yeah, I'd, I'd want <laughs> I'd want there to be a benefit for for both both clubs. So I I, I just think that's like a, a straightforward con commercial conversation yeah. with Super League clubs who will see win win opportunities that we we need to be able to develop some opportunities yeah. in order to help this model be sustainable. So, but yeah, I I, I think those conversations that we've been having are relatively positive at the moment. At the moment. Yeah. So, but yeah, we will look after travel, immigration costs, and so on. That's that's like it is now. Very quickly, we've got about thirty seconds. You in the Challenge Cup next year? Yes, yes. We we've a, a, the the Rugby League have been pretty innovative in terms of coming up with a, a new model to work with. So there's no 
issues about bonds. Um, but yeah, we never w didn't want to be in the Challenge Cup. We were really, I mean, our first ever game was in the Challenge Cup. Yeah. We don't want to lose that opportunity, so we welcome the chance to come back in. Excellent. Well, that is all we've got time for on this week's show. A big thanks to my guests this week, Richard, Martin and Ricky. Don't forget you can join the conversation too on Twitter at RL Backchat. But for now, goodbye.